Carib Nation will focus today on Indo-Caribbeans in the United States of America. East Indians left India, went to the Caribbean, and now they are in the United States of America. What are their problems and how are they overcoming them? Welcome to Carib Nation. I am Paul Nero Tennessee. Today we will be discussing East Indians in the United States of America. I have with me today in the studios three very eminent Indo-Caribbeans who are living in the United States. I have Dr. Gosain, Mahin Gosain, who is the author of 12 books and he's a professor of sociology and anthropology from New York City. I, ha I have Dr. Dan Paul Narain, who is also a teacher in New York City, and he is also co-authoring a book on East Indians in the Americas. And I have with me Mala Rampertap, who is a businesswoman from New York City, but living now in Maryland, and she's also has been doing broadcasting and working as a journalist. Welcome to our discussion this evening. Uh, Thank you. Ladies Thank you. and gentlemen, we've spoken a bit about the, old, about the first a generation of immigrants. We've spoken about the problems with children. Mala, I'm interested in the, trans, the, the problems that are created with the transition or the migration with relation to man-woman relationship. In the Caribbean, there was a particular kind of man-woman relationship with particular kind of problems. And now in the United States, where we've had a tradition here of women's liberation and feminism and all that, can you develop that a bit? Tell us what new problems uh, man-woman relationship is confronting and what old problems are persisting? Well, first of all, if we look at the man-woman relationship in the Caribbean, um, it was one of subserviency and dominance, where the man was the dominant figure. He was the breadwinner. He, he was the one that wore the pants. Now, coming to America, we face a problem because a lot of households are dual income. So you have women who are becoming more educated, who are bringing in an income into the household, and as a result, our wants and desires are changing. We want more respect, we want equality, we want to be, uh, we want equilibrium across the board in the relationship. And this is uh, obviously quite a bit of a problem because of this uh, dichotomy in, in the relationship of when you look at the Caribbean and you know how men perceive us and how they're perceiving us. So is there? I, I just I just want to yeah, add a footnote to that, to... Paul, and that is that um, I, I I do agree with my sister here to some extent, but maybe not totally. And the reason for that is that I, I don't want the viewer to go away with the impression, you know, being a Caribbean man myself, oh, I don't want the, the viewer to go with the impression, you know, that Caribbean men, you know, uh, are terrible to their wives, etc., etc. Oh, I think I think a lot has not. to do I, with. I, would get to that point I think a lot has to do with the families you come from, your social class background, exactly. how you were raised. I mean, I don't think, in my view, I don't think Caribbean men are any different in terms of how women are treated than men from other parts of the world. Uh, by that I mean that in some situations women are abused and in many, many situations women are very But happy. there are also different cultures and I think the point she's making right If you come from a class where women are very highly unemployed right. in, in, in the Caribbean, yeah. so if they come here and they earn, they must be more independent and they assert well, themselves. Well, can I just say something yeah. here? And that is that I have always had, you know, some difficulty with imposing Western standards on culture groups from other parts of the world. You see, a lot of us, we get so caught up in terms of how Western standards should be used that this becomes the measuring rod and this becomes the norm. Societies have existed throughout history and they're very happy. If a woman wants to stay home and raise her children and cook food, that should be her right to do so. Yeah, but if, you come, the, if you come to the United States, there's right, a financial right. pressure that you have to work because you got to pay the mortgage. But you have if to they can the overcome that. Oh, if you could overcome that. If they that. can overcome that yeah. and the woman is content staying home. And I, I know a lot of professional women who tell me, go sign, I would prefer to stay home and look after, and look, look after my kids. Yeah, I know that is a fact. But Mala, I'm interested, is the divorce rate um, escalating among um, Caribbean yes. Indians yes. who are here mm -hmm. in the United States mm -hmm. or is it not? 
Yes, indeed it is. In fact, I was just talking to an attorney in Richmond Hill and uh, he was uh, indicating very much so that the divorce rate has gone up tremendously. But isn't that also because, not only because the women are now working, but because the unfaithful husbands now um, are now challenged in a different way than they would have been in the Caribbean? In the Caribbean, women might be more willing to accept it, but here women will now go out on their own and have their own lease on. Isn't that a but fact? But that could certainly be a factor. I don't know, though, how unfaithful the Caribbean man is. And let me give you a, a true example. Uh, a colleague of mine... Unfaithful to the vows, huh? Yeah, to I, the but vows I, I, of don't, marriage, yeah. I don't think that's necessarily true. Of course, you know, there are exceptions to that. But uh, this, this is a, a very true example, I think, that depicts what's happening in a man-woman relationship. A colleague of mine who's a very educated Guyanese Indian woman, woman um, started, uh, she is actually in the process of go, um, doing her master's and she's been married six, seven years and her husband is starting to say to her, you know, what is more important? Uh, is it your degree or me? Because you're spending more time in the library, you're becoming more educated and so her, her desires and again her, what is important to her is changing. And as a result, unfortunately, what happened is that she decided to forgo her education because she wants to remain married, please her husband, etc. And hence, three years after, they're now going through a divorce because there's that lack of satisfaction. She's here in the American society and she wants to compete. She wants to further and upgrade herself as a human being. And then there's this problem of the relationship uh, you know, with the, the cre what we are accustomed to back home and our cultural norms and, you know, mores of what a man-woman relationship is. So there, there's that problem, you know. Dan Paul wants to say. Uh, Paul, um, this back home syndrome is very much prevalent in some of the new communities in America, especially in Richmond Hill, New York City. And one of the things I think the sociologists will pick up in their research is that alcohol plays mm -hmm. a very damaging role in the family, in, in East Indian families. As a result of consumption of alcohol, too much alcohol, there's a great deal of domestic abuse on the part of men towards women. You found that in Richmond Hill? That has been happening mm -hmm. in Richmond Hill. Yeah. What about drugs? Drugs is a, is a serious problem in the Amongst United the States. Among the teenagers, Among yes. young people, among people mm -hmm. in general. Um, what is the situation with the East Indians from the Caribbean here in the United States? Is it a serious problem? I, I have not seen any figures on the drug problem. And I think one reason for that is that, you know, the drug world operates for the most part underground. And as a result, you, you cannot see it to the extent that you would see other kinds of social problems. But um, Dan Paul probably knows a little bit more about this. He's been working with the youth in Richmond Hill. And there have been numerous reports of Indian kids from the Caribbean getting involved in drugs and being arrested and sent to jail and so on. Those things have been so taking they, place more All the more. problems in America, then they, they also have all those problems. Yes, and there's, oh, there, sure. there, there, there are two isolated. problems. You're not isolated. No, no. there are two problems. Yeah. That, uh, Your culture hasn't isolated you from the mainstream mm. problem. According mm -hmm. to the Six, uh, the Warner Second Precinct in Queens, in which a great number of Guyanese people live, drugs is a big problem. And one of the things which we have not even talked about, AIDS. AIDS is very big. Yeah, well, tell us about it. Tell us about the Caribbean it. community. AIDS Th tell us, tell us. Well, AIDS is a very big uh, subject in the Indo Caribbean community. Um, it's being swept under the carpet because of our culture, our culture of being very conservative people. But if you talk to the Indo Caribbean doctors on Liberty Avenue who treat Guyanese people in particular, they will give you some very uh, astounding figures. And one of the things I think which is not being done in this community is educating people of the dangers of this HIV. Right. AIDS is a very serious problem another, in the Caribbean Another problem itself. that has been plaguing the community recently, and this has you know, began to surface, and it's more and more of a problem, uh, is teenage pregnancy. I have been talking to a lot of the school counselors in and around the Richmond Hill area, where a large concentration are Indians, and they have been talking about a rising teenage pregnancy problem in the community. Yeah. And you see, the Indian community has always been looked at as, you know, as quiet and they go about their business and so on and so forth. But when you talk about some of the people who police the community and some of the people who interact with some of these institutions, 
I, I, I think that, um, that you begin to get a slightly different picture. Uh, uh, what's going on? Now, Paul, we, we have spent a lot of time talking about all these problems. Mm -hmm. Now, I think the question should be asked, what can we do? As a well, you tell us what, what, what in Richmond Hill can you, right. what can you we think do? could be done. Not only in Richmond. First, it starts with appearance. Yeah. But, in, but in North America. Male has an idea. Well, how do you think well, we could do it? I think, uh, first of all, parents need to learn how to communicate with their children. In the context of the United States. In the States. context of, the, uh, of being in America, in the context of the academic environment and understanding the culture that our children are exposed to, and we can't keep imposing on them. Command, what, giving them yes, decrees. Command, and, and just telling them, well, this is the way we did it, and this is the way it has to be. And that's a big problem. So I think we, if we can start to correct the parent-child relationship, and there's more communication, a lot of, and in fact, one in, in my profession, owning a model agency in New York, I get a lot of uh, girls and guys that come in because the modeling profession is very attractive to anyone. And um, what I see is a common denominator with our kids is while they may be academically doing very well, socially, in terms of persona, in terms of language, in terms of style and dress and social etiquette, if you will, they are not on a competitive level for American standards. And again, that, has, that goes back to the family environment and how they're, how they're brought up and how they're being communicated to. What about intermarriages? In the Caribbean, Indo-East Indians have been a bit resistant to marrying outside of the race. Um, is that the same thing here in the United States? No. Colin Clark did some work on that, um, and he found about 97% of the marriages are still racially endogamous, endogamous, meaning that they marry within the group, as opposed to exogamous. Um, the group in the United States with the lowest divorce rate are the Irish Americans, 1.8 per every 100, and then followed by Italians, 2 point per every 100. With the work I did with the Indians, it's about 5 per every 100. Now, you have to look at these marriages in terms of who got married for a green card and who got married for romantic love. And I think therein lies a fundamental difference because in the statistics it's all going to show up as they got married. You follow? So the rate of intermarriage, um, the rate of intermarriage with the Indian community is definitely rising. Uh, when you look at many Indians, for example, many Indians are intermarried with Hispanics, for example. Mm -hmm. That seems to be increasing significantly. Uh, you all, you're also beginning to see a lot of uh, black Indian marriages and a lot of white Indian marriages. Um, so I don't have figures for the rate of intermarriage per se, but I would definitely say that the, the rate of intermarriage is definitely Speaking increasing. about marriages, you know one of the interesting things is that um, in Guyana and Trinidad and these countries in the Caribbean, if you have a visa or you have citizenship in the United States, it's a big thing. And therefore going back to get a bride in the Caribbean uh, makes you a, a big trump card. And a lot of marriages are being arranged because based on finance and also based on the fact that the, the, the male or the female has possessed a passport. Uh, have you all had experience of these kind of marriages? Have they been working or well, not been working? We, well, what you say is true, but that is not unique to the Caribbean. Historically, yeah, yeah, but we are speaking about the Caribbean. Subcontinent yeah, but we are speaking about yeah, yeah, nine yeah, yeah. out of ten marriages. That is were true, arranged. but we are speaking about the Caribbean. So I'd like your opinion on the Caribbean. What has, how has that been contributing towards uh, man-woman relationships, marriages, the family system? Has it, have they been working? In the old days, they, they had arranged marriages and a lot of them worked. But how has it been working? Or after somebody is married, after a month, two months, do they get divorced or do they stay in a marriage? I don't think we really have an answer to that. Yeah. It's a very individual situation. And even though marriages may be arranged to a great extent, love can certainly follow after. So, but in terms of statistics, I think that's it's a very yeah, really. personalized thing. It's I, I do say. think still that more people, I would say more than half of the Indians, you know, um, they get married on the basis of uh, their own individual attractions uh, for one another and to one another. But there are situations still where marriages uh, are arranged. The other thing about arranged marriages is that it may not come across as an, as an arranged marriage, but when you look at the network that they find themselves in, that somebody has a son who knows somebody who has a daughter, it's not necessarily arranged, but it's still the network they are working, so to speak. So and America is known so as a blind date. So it's, an, so it's an old practice in a new context. 
Well, listen, mm -hmm. we're going to get back to that and we're going to deal with some other issues uh, dealing. I'd like to deal with the question of how East Indians in the Caribbean here in the United States uh, relate to East Indians directly from India. But we are going to take a break now and we'll, we'll be back in just a few minutes. Please do not leave your TV sets. Welcome back to Carb Nation. We are discussing East Indians in the United States of America, but East Indians from the Caribbean in the United States of America. Dr. Gosain, just before we took the break, I raised the point about East Indians from India. Now here we have a situation where East Indians first came from India to the Caribbean and in a second wave of immigration to the United States. Now for the first time, you're meeting East Indians from India in large numbers in the sense that new East Indians, East Indians that just came from India. How have the East Indians who have just migrated from India to the United States been relating to East Indians that have come to the Caribbean? The question is a good one. For the outside observer, the Indian community is homogeneous, but every Indian will tell you it is not. And when you look at the relations that exist between the Indians from the Caribbean and the Indians from India, who live in the United States, there is a dividing line. The Indian national sees us from the Caribbean as people who are Western, as people who assimilate, and who have assimilated Western values, and therefore we are not regarded as an integral part of India. I don't know if you have read Vidya Naipaul's uh, introduction, um, India, a Wounded Civilization. Yes, I read it. Where he talked about the fact that he said, India is my home, but yet India cannot be my home. Because as a person being raised, born and raised in Trinidad, studying in England and so on, now living there, going to India for the first time, he didn't feel as though he, he was a part of India. When you look at Indian, the Indian national, uh, nationals' relations with the Caribbean East Indian living in New York or the United States in the whole, they don't form groups that would include both sets of people. They are very, they're very factionalized in terms of how they do things. And there's a tremendous amount of uh, animosity, I would say. Though, you know, if you ask the Indian national, one of the first things they would say to you is that, you know, we reach out to all of our brothers and sisters and so on and so forth. When Indians were massacred in, in, in Guyana, uh, during uh, the, Burnham the Burnham dictatorship. Uh, Indira Gandhi India did nothing. Silent, yeah. Indira Gandhi did absolutely nothing. When Indians were literally thrown out of Uganda by the petty thug uh, Idi Amin, India did absolutely nothing. When uh, Fiji witnessed its coup, yeah, that was India did nothing. Abuse, yeah. So India has this good line of saying we care about our people, but when they find themselves amid some kind of conflict and difficult situation, India doesn't come forth. One thing I must say that I admire with Israel, and that is that Israel always reaches out to its people. And therein lies the fundamental difference between Israel and India. So, Dan Paul, um, would you say that this kind of reality um, forces the Indo-Caribbean in the United States to strengthen their ties with their homeland being the Caribbean, Guyana, Trinidad, and so forth. Well, it should. Because they come to realize yes. that the myth they had when they were in the Caribbean about yes. India being the motherland, perhaps, it's no longer true it's when no, you meet an Indian. It's no Indian. longer true. When, West, mm -hmm. when Indian cricket teams visit the West Indies exactly. to play cricket, they have a large amount of support, lots of support, for, especially in Guyana. Yeah. Because of and the, Trinidad. And Trinidad because of the Indian population. Yeah. When you come, when you leave and you come here to interact and mix with the indigenous people from India here, the relationship at best is very ambivalent. Yeah. Because uh, our customs perhaps are same, but they view us as being different people. We don't speak the language, we don't interact. And even among the Indian community itself, there is a great deal of division. I mean, among the Keralese, the Gujaratis, the Bengalis. They have their own They have world their own views. enclaves, yes. their own the world division. Views. So that we, to fit into that model, find it extremely difficult. Mala, but have you also not discovered, I have discovered interacting with Indians that from India, that 
they are more uh, um, uh, a more conservative kind of people. Um, we are more, um, they are more introvert. We are more extrovert from the Caribbean. We speak loudly. We are more flamboyant and all that. That is the kind of difference I found. I found like there, there's a difference there. And I'm, I'm happy about that difference. I uh, haven't gone to India on several occasions. Um, you're right that there, there are a lot of differences in terms of personality displays, but I think also that when you look in terms of the relationship here of Indians from the Caribbean and Indians from India, in their perception and the Indians from India perception, we, I don't think they will ever accept us as total Indians, quote unquote. And, um, you know, we have also a culture of our own, being uh, a Caribbean uh, culture, oh, yeah. which, which oh, yes, is that a, we embrace. a transaculturation with the African culture, the Amerindian culture mm -hmm. and so forth. Dan Paul, what, what I would like to know is, is, is this. When you, when, when you are here in, um, in the United States, how do you feel in terms of your, your, your consciousness? Do you define yourself as a Guyanese, as an Indo-Caribbean, as an Indian? How do you, how do you define yourself? Well, as an Indo-Caribbean, a Guyanese of Indo-Caribbean extraction. extraction. That's a how Guyanese you define American. A Guyanese, but so Guyanese, Guyanese means your nationality, right. and Indo-Caribbean yeah, means you belong to a broader sphere in the Caribbean. So you have a kind of a, a, a two-dimensional personality identity. And we are, Guyanese and Caribbean. And we are very fortunate as a people to do that. To have that. To have that. Because it makes you more complex, it makes you broader in your perspective. Uh, Dr. Gosai, I, 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 I feel the it's same way. It's very interesting that I feel that the same concept. way because uh, almost every semester when I walk into class, you know, I'll ask the students to tell me a little bit about themselves. And then, naturally, they would ask me. And I would sort of play the guessing game, well, where am I from? And almost every student will say, well, you're from India. India. Because exactly. I look Indian. Yeah. And uh, maybe I have a funny Indian accent too. So they think that I'm from India. And then I would say, no, I am not from India. And actually, in the past, I would get a little bit mad when they would say, I'm from India. So I would tell them, I grew up in a country where steel band, calypso, carnival, you know, and lots of rum and coke and beautiful beaches. I feel very positively identified with Trinidad. I identify very, very strongly with it. Um, so while I don't want to lose my Indian roots, I mean, I want to be who I am. I am Indian, and the world is going to see me as such. I want to know about India, but if you ask me which country I identify with, definitely Trinidad. There's okay, no I want, uh, this brings me to another question, and that is that um, it, when you, when you relate towards other races from the Caribbean in the United States, let's say the African Caribbean, do you find you can relate easier to the African Caribbean than you can relate to the East Indian directly from India? Absolutely. Definitely. Mm -hmm. we Absolutely. Sure. We grew up so you seem Absolutely. to have more in common yes. in your behavior, your outlook, Absolutely. your dance, your culture, yes. your loud speaking, your, your mannerisms, yes. your idiom, more with the African Caribbean than you think. And then bring the next one. How do you relate? How, how but do that, you mind you, that is only on a social and, and to some extent cultural level. If we look at it from a religious aspect, then obviously we identify and, 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 with and In addition more. to that, very quickly, we, we share a similar history, as we were talking okay. about. Right. I mean, the Afro-Caribbean, the Indo-Caribbean share a similar history. Right. The, the problem is this. If a black person from the Caribbean were to come to New York City and has to interact with black people from Africa, they would feel and share an exact same problem that we are going to face with Indian people. That uh, makes me think of something else, and that is New York City. All of you have had experience in New York City. There are a lot of Hispanics and a lot of African Americans, Hispanic Americans, African Americans. How have East Indians from the Caribbean been relating to the African Americans and to the Hispanic Americans? Have you been having difficulties? Uh, what about the, the, the Caucasian American? Or have you been... Well, perhaps that depends uh, on what generation you're looking at in terms of the older generation and a working class uh, generation like us. I think we, we don't really have much of a problem. If you look at the teenagers and then the, again coming back to the high schools, I think they do have a problem in terms of cultural identity. Um, Indians, Caribbean Indians, uh, they're not whites, but they're not blacks. And they're well, not is there Spanish, a lot of interaction so with the African-American and Hispanic-American? 
In the school system, yes. In the yes. schools, yes. 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 Are, you all, are, are Estonians from the Caribbean aware that, for example, on the very recently in the 60s, uh, that black people did not, could not eat in a coffee shop and so forth, and that African Americans made a tremendous contribution in this country to win civil rights? Do, when they enjoy these rights that they enjoy now, uh, are there, is there an awareness in the, in the Indo-Caribbean community in the United States that they owe some of this wonderful life to the struggles of the African American people, or that consciousness is not there? That knowledge, that consciousness. Well, the consciousness is there uh, to a certain segment of the population. I mean, the young people who would have learned about Martin Luther King, exactly. his Malcolm, contribu X, Malcolm X, their contribution to American politics and then the civil rights movement and uh, the end of segregation and so on in the South. Uh, they, those people would have had a great impact on this young population. I'm not so sure about the older generation. Do you believe that um, Indo-Caribbean people, East Indians from the Caribbean and the U.S., um, you know, in the United States, retiring is a very important thing. It's as important mm -hmm. as the lifetime you work. Do you think they'll retire to the Caribbean or they will retire in the United States? They'll retire here and they will die here. Yes. Yeah. Despite the fact that they might have all good intentions of returning. Um, most immigrants come, as I had mentioned, uh, I think it was in the earlier show, they come as sojourners. They come to make some money to go back one day. But they don't ever end up going back. So in all likelihood, they would retire here and they would die here. And it's one of the um, reasons, I'm, I'm sorry, sorry one of the reasons that will, will happen is that typically we tend to reside where our children grow up and live. That's a very important point. So we're not point. going to leave our children That's a very behind. important point, the grandchildren and oh, the yes. children. And so, so even forth. with the older generations, they may rem you know, romance with the idea of going back home. But realistically, as uh, you know, Mahin said, we're going to die right here. It's what, there it's is what a... I've called um, the myth of the grand return. The myth of the grand, grand return. return. Mm -hmm. When they come here, the first thing they say, I'm going to be here for six months, a year, catch my hand, get some mm -hmm. money, and go and back, go back. And go either back to home. Florida or retire to Guyana or Trinidad. And they keep postponing this year after year after year until eventually there's no more return. It still never comes. I'd like to thank you, Dr. Gosain, for having been a panelist on this discussion. And um, I'd like, I'm looking forward to seeing you again. I wish you well in the book that you're working on. East Indians in the Americas. And probably on the next occasion we could talk about that. Dr. Dan Paul, thank you for being on the thank program. You. And Mala, thanks again, and we are looking forward to seeing you again on, on Carib Nation. This is Carib Nation once more saying thank you, and we look forward to seeing you again in our next series.